A very good afternoon, and thanks for clicking on to the Friday edition of Vogan's European Outlook. It is the 7th of July, and we've reached the end of week one. And I think it's safe to say that it has been rather unsettled and disturbed. It looks as if we are going to maintain that unsettled theme as we progress through the remainder of, well, pretty much the rest of July, in fact, if the models prove correct. Now, of course, I've been harping on recently about that storm that hit the, you know, the Netherlands. It brought a month's worth of rain to East Anglia, and it brought the, all sorts of the, the destruction and damage. It, certainly for midsummer levels, it is quite unusual to see that. But I wanted to point this out to you. This was a very interesting tweet here by our friends at World Climate Service, and they actually brought this up which is something that I didn't actually um, realize until I seen it and they go on this tweet goes on to say that the Arctic stratosphere doesn't get much attention during the summertime and, and rightly so that is the case but for the, for weeks the models have been signaling a deep long-lived anomaly focused within the lower sh stratosphere which is rather interesting so the l lower stratosphere would be a kind of 50 millibars and that quite often, and I've made mention of this during the winter time, that the lower portion of the stratosphere tends to be more connected to the troposphere and it affects the 500 millibar pattern, um, which of course 500 millibars being 18,000 feet above our, our heads, that's kind of the top, the ceiling of uh, the lower portion of the atmosphere, the, the troposphere of course. But uh, it's interesting how they say that this long-lived anomaly focused in the lower stratosphere, for now it's connected to a persistent trough over northern Europe. Isn't that rather interesting how we're seeing the connection even uh, you know, in the middle portion of the summertime with the lower stratosphere? Is this some sort of a response to... What we've seen back with the sudden stratospheric warming, for example, is it also an even bigger response, a bigger indirect uh, consequence to even the Tonga Hunga volcanic eruption that took place way back, you know, a year past in January? There is there is definitely stuff going on, folks. That that's very very interesting indeed. Unfortunately. I'm even struggling to grasp, but I know there's plenty of questions there in the comments with regards to various aspects of both weather, meteorology, climate. And sometimes I just simply don't know the answer. Some some folks are, are putting some terrific uh, thoughts out there as well. And I really appreciate that, actually, because it really does get me thinking with regards to the big picture. But this is fascinating stuff that we're seeing uh, you know, an anomaly within the lower stratosphere um, actually have impact on the 500 millibar pattern. And uh, that is having a response to the 500 millibar um, anomaly here. So this is the 100 millibar height anomaly here. And you can see here that basically the trough that is over northern Europe at the moment is actually, or this is actually the period between the 6th and the 15th of July. And of course, if we look, at the GFS Ensemble for day six through 10, it reflects very nicely what this is showing here at, at 100 millibars here. So this is the lower portion of the stratosphere and it is the biggest negative anomaly anywhere in the Northern Hemisphere, which is very, very interesting indeed. Remember that if we, of course, have lower pressure over uh, unusually warm waters, which we've got at the moment, that has that kind of feedback between the ocean atmosphere, atmosphere to ocean. We're seeing that response, that connection. And I believe that it feeds back on itself and it continues. And it looks as if it's going to continue as we go forward. But a big thank you to World Climate Service for this tweet, because it really did get me thinking. And, I, you know, I thought this has to be. Uh, at the starter of, of, of my video today looking at this and uh, truly fascinating stuff indeed and it's even more fascinating when you think this is the pattern here for the 6 to 10 this is the 11 to 15 and that negative that is within the lower stratosphere is 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 then mirroring and it's hard to say mirror when you're Irish 
is reflective of the 500 millibar pattern and therefore reflective of the surface pattern as well. And this reinforces what I've been saying with regards to July. And we need to watch for rainfall. Uh, I think we are going to increase big time. You know, gone is the, the concerns of drought, certainly at the moment. I know it's not completely wiped out, but isn't it interesting? As soon as drought starts to get mentioned, the pattern tends to turn around. So, of course, we've got a warm upcoming five days as per the latest GFS Ensemble, of course. No surprise there. The trough, as said way back last week, the effects that we're seeing over North America, in turn affects the jet stream over the North Atlantic, and in turn affects Europe. And that is exactly what we're seeing at this moment in time. But here's the 6 to 10, below average, anywhere from Western Iberia up through the UK and Ireland, even the 11 to 15. Remember, this takes us all the way to the 22nd of July. And this is the two meter temperature anomalies. Northern and Western Europe is below average as per the latest GFS run. Certainly isn't below average this afternoon. This is the current temperatures. You can see here we're knocking on the door of 30 in the south of the UK. But even up across the north, thanks to southerly winds, we're seeing temperatures 24, 25 possibly 26 degrees Celsius this afternoon. And we are going to increase the temperature further as we progress through the next 24 hours or so. By the way, Cape values, it looks as if the level of energy available within the atmosphere for tomorrow afternoon, looks as if some of the models are starting to try and kind of pull back a wee bit on the, on the intensity, on the available energy that is within the atmosphere tomorrow afternoon. Of course, we've got this area of low pressure. We've seen the first one now positioned due west of Scotland, as you can see here, and a secondary system. These two features kind of almost uh, kind of doing a Fujiwara. You get these uh, West Pacific typhoons that kind of dance around each other. Well, I know it's not the same thing, but they're almost doing a slight Fujiwara in the Northeast Atlantic by kind of spinning around each other, dumbbelling around each other. Quite an interesting thing when you see that, especially on satellite uh, that's animated. So this area of low pressure, of course, brought the heavy persistent rain uh, during the overnight last night. That frontal boundary then moves off to the north, out into the, the North Sea or the Norwegian Sea. It's this feature right here to the south that's deepening that has the associated frontal system. What we're gonna see is this area of low pressure starts to move in towards the UK. As it does so, it continues to scoop up that warm, juicy air up from the south and southeast. We are gonna see 30 plus tomorrow. Do we see 32? Do we exceed the, the, the 32.2 that we've seen twice this year back in June? That is gonna be the question. It's gonna be a question of how much it's all about the timing and even the timing with regards to the heat humidity uh, will be critical in terms of how much, uh, you know, thunderstorms we actually get, how severe they become, how much damage and wind we may see, large hail, uh, frequent lightning, gusty winds. And of course, somebody had made mention, I, I talked about a little bit about the dynamics with regards to thunderstorm production yesterday. Made, somebody had made mention about is that how tornadoes form well in a sense in the sense yes it does uh, you know it's all about the spin within the atmosphere the shear of course that's the the difference in wind speed and direction with height of course that's known as the lapse rate and the the stronger the, the lapse rate the faster the air wants to shift from the low levels to the upper levels and of course as that cold front moves in it's kind of bringing a layer of cooler air within the mid levels of the atmosphere. So what that does is, of course, as the land and humidity bubbles up at the surface during the course of the daytime, the temperature, of course, rises, the humidity rises, or it's already present, in fact. But that cooler aloft then triggers that warmer to then lift up through the column and then produces the showers and thunderstorms. Do we see enough buildup of heat during the afternoon before that frontal system moves in? Does the front actually start to weaken as it moves east? Looks as if some of the models are almost slightly indicating that. But as we play through the loop, you can see here this area of low pressure hooks up with the existing low to the north. 
and of course we've got all this warm humid air riding uh, out from a southeasterly direction keeping an eye on temperatures even in north northern portions of scotland does that wind uh, strong southeasterly wind blows over the grampians over the cairngorms downstream of that along the murray coast we could push 30 celsius believe it or not tomorrow somewhere between Nern and uh, you know Lossiemouth, for example even up towards kinloch u the northwest highlands we could see some very warm temperatures tomorrow thanks to the fern effect that downslope compressional warming that we see as winds cross over the hills of course further south we are probably going to see temperatures 30 to 32 celsius even across broad areas we could see the mid to high 20s tomorrow afternoon so it's going to be a warm day but it's also going to be quite a dynamic day because this area of low pressure will try and throw its arm its cold front eastwards and as it does so we then need to watch out for the development of showers and thunderstorms winds converging also means that it forces the air and the column to lift and the question is do how much thunderstorm activity do we see where exactly do we see it i think east of the pennines initially and then it may start to migrate west of course remember as these showers and thunderstorms blow up along the cold front we're already starting to introduce fresher cooler air into the southwest in the southern portions of wales even in the western fringes of, of scotland as well as that frontal system then progresses slowly eastwards but it's all about the timing and the level of instability within the atmosphere is going to be key in terms of what we actually see tomorrow now this is actually only a look for england and wales i do apologize scotland uh, i'm not england biased or i'm not biased towards any particular location as some people may think uh, I'm trying to simply show you everything that's going on. But I'm wanting to show you the Cape values. This is the convective available potential energy within the atmosphere. This is off initially the RPEG model. And you can see here as we play it through the loop, as that cold front edges eastwards meets the, the hot humid air, then we start to see the increase in instability within the atmosphere. You can see it initially through the you know in a spine between Southampton, Birmingham up towards the Liverpool area. Then it shifts eastwards, and as it shifts eastwards, I would imagine the level of instability would increase as we go through into the late afternoon and into the early evening. We could see some very lively thunderstorms, especially you know beyond 5 p.m. tomorrow. It depends on how fast that cold front moves east as well, by the way, and also it's not exclusive to England and Wales. We could see some very lively thunderstorms, heavy rainfall, even across scotland even in north of scotland later in the day tomorrow and we need to keep a close eye on that as we go forward but this is the r page model let's have a look at the arome model and um see what it's showing it's not overly enthusiastic if i'm being truthful with you with regards to the level of of instability within the atmosphere it's not overly showing anything dramatic these you typically would expect to see these bright colors representing very strong uh, upward motion instability and whatnot and we're simply not really seeing it let's have a look at the ecmwf by the way and let's have a look at the uk overall and see now i'm not ignoring europe because there is plenty of things going on here as well um please excuse me if you live in europe but let's have a quick look before i run out of time so you can see here this uh, area of low pressure starts to kind of become one system and then of course we've got all these showers and thunderstorms blowing up Let's have a quick look and see if i can get to the uk version and a better a better look on it here so let's have a play through it you can see here there was charging a a few rogue thunderstorms today here it is so this is 12 o'clock you can see here these lines are starting to appear these convective lines shown on the ecmwf showing up there's a couple of bands that we need to pay attention to seen by the model and then as late as 2100 so that's 9 p.m tomorrow looks as if scotland becomes the focus of showers and thunderstorms later in the day tomorrow and then of course we start to get a mix of much fresh air coming in off the atlantic we'll look at the, the longer range uh, in uh, you know early next week here but it certainly looks as if low pressure is just going to become the dominant player as i play through this ucmwf loop you can see here one system after another with a trough in place areas of low pressure just spin around and we're locked in this kind of washing machine effect of cool, fresh, unsettled air. 
Ran out of time. No video as per usual tomorrow, but I will have a global weather and climate report coming up tomorrow. South Africa recorded its warmest night on record 